Right. So I'm Frater Anubis, and this is our introductory course to our temple. We are a recognized temple of Frater Barabbas's uh, ESSG, Egregora Sancta Stella Gnostica. You can see behind me over here on the wall. <sighs> I think I am going to be walking around the room and showing some of the artifacts and things that are here. This is our temple charter, signed by Frater Anubis himself. I mean, Frater, yeah, I signed it, but Frater Barabbas. That's his signature, founder of our order. We are a sanctioned temple. He initiated me uh, back in my 20s, gave me a lot of access to his uh, unpublished works, which there is an absolutely enormous amount. So the temple teachings, it is a very pagan, very goddess oriented. His training came out of uh, Alexandrian Wicca and he combined it with even more advanced ritual techniques that he researched and discovered and passed on to us. Now, I call it hermetic ritual magic for a reason. I really want to get away from calling anything Eastern and Western. I think it's lazy and it perpetuates this idea that there's an East and a West. Like, where does the East begin and the West end? Do, is, is Iran part of the East or the West or the Middle East? We can be a little more specific than that. And also this tradition started out in Egypt and traveled to Greece, to the Arab Peninsula, to Spain, to Europe, to America, and, and of course now the world. So to call something Western is really um, something we can get away from. Cool. One good way to sort of think about traditions, and this is just a tool for, for understanding that there are ritualists and there are ceremonialists. A ceremonialist is working within an orthodoxy, a tradition. They have rank, they have authority to work within that tradition, and they need to perform the rituals flawlessly. For example, um, a Catholic priest performing a burial rite or an exorcism, a Taoist priest performing a marriage, those are people who are part of a tradition, they're initiated, and they have to perform the ritual perfectly. In some cases, it, the ritual is worthless if it's not done right. On the other end of the spectrum, you have ritualists. A ritualist learns, the, understands the tradition, may or may not have authority within that tradition, may be initiated, may be self-initiated. Once they learn the basics of rituals, and they understand them, and they can understand that there's technique and lore, then you must put them in your own words. To be a, a ritual magician is to create your own tradition, a tradition of you. That's not to say in a group you can have shared rituals, but you have to understand it enough that you can write it yourself. So hermetic, why hermetic? Between two and 400, um, before the common era, the Greeks were down in Egypt um, in the library of Alexandria. And they discovered the rich, ancient magical tradition and powerful spiritual tradition of, of Egypt. Uh, I was looking for a book earlier called Rebel in the Soul, like to rebel in the soul. You can get off Amazon for like 12 bucks. It, probably like four to 6,000 years old. It could have been written yesterday. And it's a story of an initiate, a priest, who is having his crisis of faith. He's having his dark night of the soul. I mean, this could have been written yesterday. And he's crying out to his ka, his soul, and saying, why should I continue on this earth? There's, everybody's a liar. People don't follow the words of the gods. Everyone's greedy, everyone's selfish. I can't trust the government. I can't trust the, the clergy. Why can't I just sacrifice my flesh and go to join the, the gods in the afterlife? And his soul replies to him, he says, no, that's not how it works. Only through the living Nifa can the intellect reach the heart. 
and become the haven for the upstream struggle. Because the Egyptians had the idea that there were multiple layers of parts of the soul, like an egg, a shell, an inner membrane, all the way down to the core ego, the tool that we create for this incarnation. So the, the Greeks found this tradition going on and were just blown away. And they said, oh my God, Toth, he must be like Hermes. So we'll combine him with Hermes and we'll make uh, Hermes Trismegistus, the, tr the thrice great Toth. And that's where we get the Emerald Tablet of Hermes Trismegistus. Most of the translations are Arabic because the traditions grew and changed. Um, we have the early Hermetic corpus, the early teachings and um, alchemy, alchem from Egypt, the dark, uh, Egypt was chem. The Emerald Tablet, and we read it, it's a very, very short, mysterious document. It talks about as above, so below, as within, so without. There's a lot of different translations. Uh, thou falsehood, certain, most certain. What is above is like that which is below, and what is below is like that is above, to make the miracle of the one thing. And then it goes on, but that's the important part. We have the macrocosm and the microcosm, the above and the below, a an idea that you'll find throughout all kinds of traditions, Taoism, um, uh, certain Tibetan traditions, that there's the macro, the greater universe, your karmic destiny field, and the micro, this life. And the goal of magic is, of course, to fuse them, get to the point where they're one thing, as above, so below, as within, so without. That's the first clue on the path to understanding how it's all supposed to work. There's the idea that um, there's your greater connection to the universe and the microverse, the pleroma. See, ultimately it's all one thing. Ultimately, if you can achieve that level of enlightenment, you can see the universe as a whole, that there is no without and within, no above and below, that there's just one continuum that you're a part of. As long as you sort of see yourself as separate from the universe itself, then you create an adversarial relationship with it. You see like, oh, how can I get the universe to do what I want it to do? How can I manipulate? How can I control? How can, and ultimately you're just getting in your own way because you're setting up a precondition that there's you and something else, and it's really only you. Once you have that, once you can sort of work towards that, then you can realize that it's all one thing and the universe will cooperate with you. And the art of magic will take you there, it'll teach you. So everything went along fine with the Hermetic, uh, Corpus Hermeticum, which was a very interesting, sometimes contradictory document through the Greeks, the Romans, the Arabs, knew the, and then eventually in Spain, there was around the 1500s, there was a really just, just um, revolution of thought. And this came out, the sacred book of magic of Abramil and the mage. This is like a really famous book because earlier parts of the hermetic tradition talked about there was a daemon, uh, an advising spirit. Um, that you would contact, you would have this familiar, it would give you advice and you would work with it. And it would be your connection to the divine, like you with you, your daemon that connect you and then the gods themselves. Abramelin, who is a Jewish person living in Germany in late 14, early 1500s, um, came, came up with a little, took it a little bit further. The idea was, to be a great magician, you had to actually be a spiritual person. It wasn't just a matter of getting rocks and herbs and things like that together and, and causing an effect, that you actually had to be, have spiritual prowess, that you actually had to meditate in a sense, and 
their techniques and pray and do various things to achieve this knowledge of this holy guardian angel, which is similar, but a more advanced idea. Idea that there's this holy guardian angel, this perfect version of you, this Atman, this observer, this piece of yourself that once you become in contact with it, the first thing that they have you do once you um, contact this, uh, this powerful uh, version of yourself is go out and boss around all the demons and devils in the world. Sounds crazy, but the idea is if you can connect with the higher self as a below, so above, then you need to look at the aspects of yourself that are out of control, the lower realms, and bring those up and redeem them so that you create this perfect channel of energy from above to below and back up again. And so that was hugely influential and influenced a lot of people. And then later on, of course, we have John D, the 1580s, who um, and the Kabbalah at that time was pulled in. Um, I, want to, I don't want to talk about Kabbalah yet, but the, the Jewish Kabbalah came into the, this tradition at that point and as a map of the universe. It's both a map of consciousness and a map of the universe. And in order to get at these more spiritual aspects, we need these maps. They're subjective maps. It's not really meant to be an exact like a map of roads, but it's a, a map of concepts and how to unite, how to break the universe apart in such a way that you can sort of work with it and understand the various components. And then John Dee, um, who had absolutely unbelievable results working with angels in the 50 to 80s and created an entire system of magic that took about 500 years to figure out. And so the system is like constantly changing and growing until we get to uh, Levi and uh, the 1800s, who probably wasn't really a magician, but he started pulling the material together. And then, of course, the Golden Dawn. Black, all misprinted. And yeah, this was really helpful. <laughs> So I got I got about as far as the material we're going to talk about tonight, um, and then I got stuck, and that's when I ran into Brian, or Fraud or Bar Barabbas um, at the Crystal Connection when I was um, in a crystal shop, and he knew his stuff, and he helped me to get past a lot of stuck points, and he gave me like some of his original material that he originally. That you know eventually ended up in the books that he's published. And then we had uh, the cult revival, of the early 20th century, with the Theosophists and uh, the introduction of Buddhism and Yogi. Um, um, those influences, of course, Broly and the Golden Dawn, and we get to Wicca and the, you know, people are starting to create their own traditions, their own magical. And that kind of leads us up to today. I mean, I don't want to, I mean, talk for months about the history, but it gives you an idea of this thread going all the way back to the brilliance of the ancient Egyptians and their, their ideas of the soul and how to connect it all together. And then, you know, you wonder, okay, well, what does that have to do with magic? Once you become more aware of who you really are, and you understand, um, you understand your connection with the universe, then the energy will flow through you. The idea is that back at the beginning of time, the creator was gender neutral creator was seeking some form of enlightenment. And so the creator fell asleep and dreamed it was a quark. And within the dream of the quark, it dreamed it was an atom. And with the, within the dream of the atom, it dreamed it was a molecule. Within that, it dreamed it was a stone. Then it dreamed it was a storm. And then it dreamed it was a planet. And then it dreamed it was a sun. And deeper and deeper into these dreams, it went until it started dreaming it was you know, a bird. 
and a cat. And then within the dream of the cat, it fell asleep. Eventually it woke up and dreamed that it was you. And so the creator is sleeping within you. And the idea is that if you can wake up just enough that you can dream the dream of your life lucidly, then reality becomes malleable. You don't want to wake up too much because then the dream is over. But with this system, you can start to wake up just enough that you can dream this life in a lucid fashion. And it becomes malleable to a degree. You can never break the laws of physics. Otherwise, the dream would be over for everyone. And so it doesn't work that way. But there's a lot that can be done. And overall, the, the, if I wanted to describe the whole system of magic uh, together, there's a Greek word called idolon. Now, the Greek idolon means is where we get our word idol. So it's an image. We're doing temple work and we're going to different points and we're drawing like a, a invoking pentagram of fire or water. We're creating these energy fields. Energy fields build up and become more complicated. And the more complicated they are, the more powerful they are. And then they model different forces that are the universe that are within us and that are with, within the, the greater universe itself. They are a model, a goal on an idol. And once we create the energy field, a lot of people stop there and they just work with the energy, which is totally fine. And there are times when I would do that myself. But once you've created that energy field that matches a spirit or quality or a goddess, then you invoke the intelligence from the collective unconscious into that energy sphere. And then exponentially more powerful. And then what? Well, then you have a spiritual experience. You have a revelation. You wake up a little bit as according to some specific subject. Like you could do an Anakian angel for, let's say, fire of water, the king of cups. You build an energy sphere. First, you invoke water. I mean, yeah, first you invoke water, then you invoke fire. You fuse it together, and then you would do these knock-in calls, these prayers, and connect into that flow of consciousness. And then you'd experience it. And you would have a revelation that would help you to understand other people that would break down the barriers. And you can create these different experiences very specifically based on different elements and planets as you become your building blocks. And then you impress your will, what it is that you'd like to change in your life on the energy field, and you send it out to do your bidding. So you have the revelation, and then you impact the causality sphere, the operant field of the universe, your sphere of energy that you created in your space vibrates out into the greater universe and causes change benefit of this is that the magic is permanent. You have changed by the act of, by the ritual act, and you've sent your will out. But that's kind of a, an overview. Um, in that there's, you know, it can become a hall of mirrors sometimes. There's so, there's so many possibilities, so many different ways to use it, so many things to do and to learn. So, Let's start with the most basic practices. Obelistic cross, which is connect to your highest self, the most perfect version of you, to ground the energy in the earth, and then to balance it, to harmonize it. The one practice, if you only learn this, you will be so Let's talk about the tree of life real quick. Several libraries have been written about the Tree of Life, and it's a very interesting subject. 
but I don't want to burden you by going too deeply into it. Let's see. So here's the diagram. This is the basic, there are 10 spheres that incidentally are the tarot cards, one through 10. Of course, in four worlds, four elements, 40 small cards. And there are 22 paths connecting it, 22 being the major arcana of the tarot. So you can see this is right away. This is the model of the tarot. This is where the modern 78 card deck gets its meaning, which is a ritual tool that of course we use. Briefly, the first three supernals, these three at the top, this is the point, this is the source, this is the ultimate creator falling asleep and dreaming everything else. In a sense, this is the only thing on the tree that's actually real. The next two are force and form in a very abstract sense. Then the energy manifests in the lower universe where we have Hesed, which is the first thing created. It is um, unselfish love, the, the willingness to give, give of yourself freely, which is balanced by Kipura, which is the will. Love and will, love is the law, love under will. I'm sure you've heard that. And then it balances in Tipra. And you see this is reflection. This first three is a reflection of the supernals above. And then there's a further reflection. Netzach, which is the emotional life. Hod, which is the intellect. Yesod, which is a reflection of the sun. This is like the sun. This is the moon. And then hanging like a jewel at the bottom is Malkuth, which is the world. So all of this is to create the world, the playground ground. So this is Kether manifested. So just with that, and we can see Jupiter, Mars, the sun, Venus, Mercury, moon, and the earth, seven lower planets. Um, this becomes a great tool for organizing your ideas. In order for a ritual to have meaning, it has to have context. And so we study the diagrams like this in order to create ritual meaning so that our rituals relate to each other, that they build on each other, that they all contain a sort of the same context, which gives us a much more spiritual impact. One-offs are great, fantastic. But with this style, we're wanting to create a, it's a cookbook of techniques and ritual. So let's talk about the Kabbalistic cross. This is the basic ritual. Um, everything kind of grows out of it. You stand, and I'll, I'll demonstrate it. I'll walk through it. Stand, and you visualize yourself growing. So you get a, two, a huge ball of light above your head. Say, Eta. That's Keller. You bring the light down through your body into the earth beneath your feet and ground it, Malkuth. And you say, Megidula, Megapura, Leolam, Amen. So thou art the kingdom, the love, and the will forever and ever. Amen. Idea is that you are building this model up within your aura. It's a subjective model. It's representing something that's on the inner planes. People like to relate these ideas to organs or chakras or whatever, and that's fine. If that helps people to understand it, that's one way to go. But really, these are concepts that are going to be on the inner planes. So uh, let me stand where you can see me. For the Kabbalistic cross, I use it four times a day. I do Crowley's Libra Resh, where you do it at sunrise, at noon, at sundownish, at the end of the day, and before you go to bed. And it's also used within ritual to sort of ground energies at different points. While seated, you could do it in your mind, but basically the ritual is this, and I'll walk. I'll do a guided visualization. It only takes a moment. 
slowly breathing. That's another important skill. Imagine yourself growing larger and larger out into outer space until the earth itself is but a small ball beneath your feet. You reach up to where there is a ball of utter pure brilliance, rainbows and lens flares going out into the universe. You touch the light, bring it down to your forehead and vibrate. Eh, down the heart chakra, and then all the way into the earth beneath your feet. So you're standing in a column of light. the energy up to your left shoulder and visualize the blue energy of Hesed, Jupiter, the expansion what we were just showing you on the on the tree. Uh, all the blue flames. Bring it across the heart to your right shoulder. Imagine red flame. This is Mars. This is will. Egevura Leolam Amen. Thou art the kingdom, the glory, and the power forever and ever. Amen. So thou art the, the willingness to give of yourself unselfish love and the will to protect and manifest your will to make things happen. Balanced and centered forever. But that's the basic ritual. Um, I can do it in my mind when I'm driving in the car in a public place. And uh, if that's the only thing that you learn, you will be very happy. The Cicero's uh, came out with this book. Their new version of the middle pillar was originally by Israel Regarde. And um, a lot of times people have a hard time um, speaking Hebrew, uh, Abrahamic religions. And in the back, they have versions in um, Egyptian, Celtic, which is a, a beautiful language, although I think you're supposed to call it Irish now. Um, so they have different versions of the verbiage. I would strongly recommend um, this book to, to go over these rituals. And also the whole idea of magical language is very important. You see, every language that we speak on a day-to-day -day basis is full of meanings. Like if I say page, it could be page. It could be somebody is a page. You can work as a page. You can page someone. Like, oh, the words are very imprecise. But if you have a magical language, then it only really means one thing. You only use it in one context. And so often you use Hebrew, Latin, Greek, and Anakian a lot. So that's the first ritual, the Kabbalistic cross. Grounding, considering, connecting to the highest source and grounding in the earth, above, below. As it is above, shall it be below. So it is within, so shall it be without. That's all you get, then greatly. The second ritual, the lesser banishing ritual of pentagram is very powerful ritual. It's a, it's called lesser meaning for general purposes. We're stuck with some, um, Awkward language because it's from 100 years ago during uh, by the Golden Dawn. Well, older than that, really, more like now, like 125, 127 years. Lesser meaning general is for general use all the time. Banishing, not really a banishing, right? I mean, it is, it does clean things out. 
But really what it more does is it orders things. If you can call banishing would be the same as say cleaning, right? If you go into a room and you clean everything, you sweep, you put everything where it's supposed to be, put your clothes away, you fold them, you clean off all the counters, you wash the dishes and put them away. And now the area is completely ordered, and completely clean. That's what's meant by banishing. It's not like you know, I'm banishing you and you're not allowed to be here. It's more like cleaning and organizing. And it's a ritual and we use pentagrams. This is pentagram for So this is the pentagram. This is the tool that we use that represents the basic four elements plus spirit. The four elements are what make up most of the actions of the microcosm. You can imagine dividing the universe by four and putting it into four sections. And the element of spirit acts as both the glue and the grease, allowing the four elements to work together, but not dissolve into each other into mud. The pentagram that we draw is on the handout. You start down by your left foot. You go up above your head, down, across to your left shoulder, your right shoulder, down to your foot. And you want to repeat the last bar. I picked up from Freighter Barabbas. It's a very powerful way to draw the pentagram. Doing is we're banishing Earth. In this pentagram, Earth, drawing the pentagram, they're fa I'm facing it. So, pentagram Earth, air, spirit, water, and fire. It's very easy to remember fire, water, spirit, air, and Earth. Air and water both contain each other, so they're very similar. Fire and Earth pretty opposite down at the bottom. So we're banishing earth. If earth contains all the other elements. By cleaning earth to all four directions, we clean and organize our microcosm. Go to the four directions. I clean earth of air, because air is for the east. And I'm, this, is, this direction is east in this room. So I'm cleaning my thoughts. I go to the south, I banish earth there. I'm cleaning my will, my passions, organizing. I go to the west, I banish earth of water. These are my emotions, cleaning and organizing those. And I go to the north. Draw the pentagram there. I'm banishing the earthiest part of earth, the densest part, you know, the actual social interactions and things in my life. And then I return to the center and I recapitulate the ritual. Something, a pattern that you'll see a lot. You do something and then recapitulate. They call it the analysis of the keyword. But basically it's like, I do these things and then I unify it. I do a thing and I unify it. And so this ritual, the short ritual contains all of the elements of all the rest of the practices. You're moving through a ritual space. You're drawing devices in the air. You're visualizing, you're vibrating names. These are all the skills that you use in the most advanced rituals to create these more elaborate sacred geometries and energy spheres that we then can use to enlighten ourselves and to modify our lives in different ways. I'll go ahead and demonstrate the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram. I 
I would do a Kabbalistic cross, which we've done, but I'll do it again real quick. Eta, Naku, Tula, Igabura, Elam, Amen. I draw the pentagram, holding my head still and following my eye, hand with my eyes. Now I charge the pentagram while vibrating the divine name for yod Hey vav Hey, which is a four letter name of God. Here we pronounce it Yahowah. Yehovah. Your energy into the pentagram and project it out so it's covering the entirety of the eastern section of the universe. And you bring you back your hand at the sign of silence. The sign that keeps any energy from bouncing back to you. Bring it around to the south. Connecting that pentagram to the pentagram I'm drawing in the south. I draw the same pentagram. Do nai. Bring it to the west. Draw the same vanishing pentagram. E Night all of them together to the center. Would normally be facing east, but I'll face the camera. Now I recapitulate. For me. Raphael, behind me, Gabriel, at my right hand, Miel, at my left hand, Uel. Well, around me, flames and pentagrams, and in the column shines a six-rayed star. Ta, Uth, Ula, Gabura, Elam, Amen. cross to balance and steal your energy at a higher level after you've just done this ritual. The four archangels represent the persona, the intelligence of the universe divided by four and four sections. The six-rayed star represents the planets, a macrocosm. I've cleaned and organized my universe. I'm standing empowered in the center of it. I'm ready to do ritual work or even just a tarot reading, or just start my day. I've connected myself to the macrocosm. Around me flame the pentagrams, and the column shines a six-rayed star. You can imagine a column of light. Buying the macro and the micro together. Uh, Crowley described, would use the magic word abrahadabra, five equals six five elements in the seven. So those are the basic practices. And I'll attach the handout to the Thank you for watching our video.